Hello and welcome again to Searching for Answers. My name is Carolyn Thompson and we're still in the book of Revelation. We're going to have a little review of chapter 12 and then go right into chapter, chapter 13. Uh, you may wonder why are we studying the book of Revelation? Well, if you look at the beginning of John, of Revelation, John, the revelator, said we'll get a blessing if we study the book of Revelation. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to proceed slowly, and hopefully we can make it as clear as possible. On my right is... Uh, my name is John Jones. I'm on the Faculty of Religion at La Sierra University. And my name is Ivan Blazin, and I'm on the Faculty of Religion at Loma Linda University. And I want people to know, Carolyn, yes. that you're really surrounded by two Johns, because Ivan Mm. in the Slavic languages and, mm. and so on, and Russian and so on, is really the name for John. Really? Yes. All right. So you have John. And the third one's here. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. right. Who calls himself a fellow sufferer. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> so we'll start suffering now. Okay. Okay. Um, as you know, the book of Daniel and the Revelation are really one, aren't they? Um, Daniel when he spoke in Daniel 7, in the book of Daniel, is a prophecy. And when John revealed or told about the revelation from God, that is a revelation, meaning to reveal. So just a little uh, something there to think about before we get started. And Ivan, would you please review chapter 12 uh, before we start with chapter 13? Well, let's see if I'm able to give a short review. <laughs> well, join in any time, John. You yeah. can help. Well, there are really three parts to chapter 12, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And it starts out with an incredible picture. A great a portent, a portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Mm -hmm. And that, that is something to say. And she was pregnant. And she was giving birth to a, a son. And then, lo and behold, another portent appears in heaven as well, a great red dragon who wants to do away with that son as soon as it is born. I see. Uh, when she had some crowns, didn't oh she yes, have oh yes. stars in her crown? Oh yes, she did, and okay. uh, 12 stars, okay. and so on. So anyway, um, instead of being able to devour the child, the child is caught up to heaven. Mm. Okay. She's unable to do this. He, mm -hmm. In fact, it says in verse 5, the latter part of verse 5, but her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. Mm. There can be no doubt about the identity of, of, of the child here. So the woman flees into the wilderness and uh, God prepared a place for her there where she's nourished for 1,260 days. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly we get this picture of a war in heaven. Again? A war, yes, a war wow. now in heaven. Mm -hmm. We had a woman in heaven and a dragon in heaven. Now we have a war in heaven. Hmm. And Michael and his angels fight against um, uh, the, uh, the angels of God. And uh, verse 9, the dragon was thrown down, mm -hmm. that ancient serpent, yeah. who is the devil and Satan. Right. He's identified as the deceiver of the whole world in verse 9 and in verse um, 10, the accuser. He's the deceiver and the accuser. Mm -hmm. All right, so he's thrown down. Mm -hmm. And what I take this uh, to mean, John, is that the base of his operations yeah. is now totally restricted. He yeah. cannot operate yeah. in heaven. He's been operating. What has he been doing there? Notice in verse 10, the latter part of it, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night mm. before our God. Mm. So now he cannot accuse them before God. He's restricted to earth. And now look at verse um, 11, which is incredible. But they, the ones that he accuses, have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony they bear, a testimony to Christ mm -hmm. undoubtedly, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. So the heavens can be joyful, but the earth to which Satan comes has a problem because he is present and he knows he has a short time and he would like to uh, hurt as many people as he possibly can hurt. Then finally, in the last section, we have the dragon 
uh, not being happy about, about this. And so um, he can't get at the child right now. So he's going to um, try to get after the woman. And uh, she flees into the wilderness. And now we have the second time. Time, a times, and a half a time. Mm. And before it was 1,260 days, same period of same time. Same time. Yeah. So he's going after her, okay. and a flood of water comes out of his mouth. But the earth, obviously under the power of God, opens up its, itself, takes in the water, and saves her. But this makes the dragon all the angrier. So he went now to make war with her children, mm -hmm. the rest of her children, her other children, the children who are related to the Messiah who was caught up to heaven. And these are identified as those who keep the commandments of God, and they have the testimony of Jesus. And this all prepares us now for chapter 13, because right. the dragon story continues. Well, looks like the devil is enraged here in chapter 12. First of all, John, the woman, as I understand it by way of review, is God's faithful ones all through history. And the yeah. crown she has with the 12 stars could be the 12 tribes. It could be the 12 apostles. It could be... Uh, um, even the sign of the zodiac was 12 stars for secular history concerning what John was talking about. And then uh, the, um, the, the, the child, the son, I, I would say for review, for those who haven't uh, been listening, is, is Jesus, the Messiah. And then there was war in heaven and Satan was cast down, the accuser of the brethren, because Satan is the dragon. And war in heaven happened again, not just at the beginning of creation, yeah. but again, because the Lamb of God, who was slain at the crucifixion, won over all the powers of the devil. And so, you see, his time is limited. So he's enraged. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, the eagle's wings yeah. take her to the desert. And you go ahead, John, and see well, if there's something I'm leaving out. No, here. I think you and Ivan have summarized it beautifully for us. The fact is that the number 12 is extremely important mm -hmm. uh, in all of this kind of writing, which we call apocalyptic literature, a fancy word for just the kind of writing that both Daniel and Revelation are. But they don't belong only to the, only these two books. There, there are a lot of other, other writings, aren't yeah. there, Ivan? Yes. Uh, apparently, this was a way of thinking and seeing uh, that was important from three or four hundred years before Jesus down until three or four hundred years after, something like that. It represented a whole uh, era and a whole way of thinking and understanding that uh, is marked by a whole number of, uh, of earmarks. But one of those important earmarks is numerology. Numbers are important. We're going to see that again later in this, uh, this discussion, aren't we? Mm -hmm. But the fact is that the kingdom of heaven has 12 gates. Yes, One for each of the right. 12 tribes. We may have a little pointer here to the completeness of God's people, the whole inclusiveness of God's divine plan. What about the foundation? Uh, yes, equally. So okay. there you go. The fact remains then that this, is, uh, this chapter 12 is a real turning point. It's a watershed, not only in the book of Revelation, but in the whole history of redemption, isn't it? Things are heightened. The tension is ratcheted up here, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah? Yes. At the end of the, of the chapter. Um, the, the, we're, we're pressing to a real showdown, aren't we, here? Um, and I think, you know, I think you said it right, Carolyn. The, the woman... Uh, represents the church in a larger spiritual sense, uh, not one denomination, not one church. Rather, the right way to say it is uh, the whole people of God through whom God plays out this divine plan of salvation. It is not the case that the church gave birth to the Messiah. Uh, in a sense, it's almost the other way around, isn't it, in a way? But that nonetheless, God has always had a people, 
yeah, and that the Messiah comes forth from within that people in a very clear way here. By the way, John, that, that people yeah. is represented by the 144,000, which itself is a multiple of 12. You were talking yeah. about the mm -hmm. 12 yeah. number, and yes. so there we yeah. have this number again, 12. Again. Yeah. yeah, the whole idea of God getting everyone into the kingdom possible to make its completeness right. sure is important. Now, now we move to the seashore, don't we? In that little transitional sentence, and you can put it either with chapter 12 yeah. or with chapter 13, depending on the pronoun. Uh, there are early manuscripts. You're talking about verse 8. Uh, right, right at the end of the chapter of, 12 the or chapter. the beginning of 13, depending how your Bible has it. And by the way, we should say, we know that you have a variety of versions mm -hmm. as you're studying with us, and we know too that you, our hearers, represent a variety of perspectives and interpretations. We understand that. So uh, hang in there with us, and we'll try to uh, express these ideas in terms comprehensible. Uh, to John, I liked it when you said that chapter 12 ratchets up the discussion. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's preparing for chapters 13 and 14, mm. which have two sides of a coin. In ah. chapter 13 are those who follow the beast, uh, the dragon and the beast and so on, who worship falsely. And then chapter 14 at the beginning is the picture of those who worship God in truth and so on. You've got a contrast. They're both marked on their foreheads and so on. So we have a study in contrast here. And after those contrasts are developed, then the thing hastens on again. We have the messages of the three angels, the final kind of thing that's coming up, and then the harvest. And you think, again, you're going to be at the end of the book of yeah. Revelation, yeah. but you will, no. it will go on. But these chapters are, are really a kind of unit. They belong yeah. together. 12 and 13. 12, 13, and 14. And 14. Okay. See? It's probably helpful for us to remind ourselves that the chapter numbers are added later. That's this right. This would not be part it, of the it original. It wouldn't be part of the original. But nonetheless, these are appropriate, these contrasts, as you say, Ivan, which really represents the polarizing of the whole cosmic order now, mm -hmm. does it? The whole universe is being pulled into two great camps, finally. It's the great all. controversy, as we say. Yeah, yeah. And yes. now, no middle ground anymore. There's no middle ground. Yeah. There is no neutral ground. Yeah. Can you picture in your mind after Jesus survives the cross, can you see Satan and his angels and God and his angels and they're coming together? I bet they had a big argument, a big crisis and say, you can't save those people. Why, look what they did. Look what he did. Look what she did. Look what David well, did, a murderer. The, that's the accuser I mean, of the brethren, right? Yeah, Moses, a murderer. David, you know, had um, the man's wife, put the man in the front line so he'd die so he could marry the wife in the Old Testament. So there's all sorts of things that um, it, it's almost like it's a trial and that God himself is on trial here. Did you ever yeah. think of it that way? Yeah. Well, some people do talk about yeah. that God on trial, but uh, I and don't then, think God is on trial in the sense that you wonder if God is good. No, it's, it's Satan who's being accusing, accusing. Yeah. Notice that big word I'm using, accusatory, it's a good John. Yes. Is it all right? Okay. <laughs> Just wanted your approval. Yes, anyway, you but, but you know, I let, as I read these, I kind of try to get a picture of what's going on, on. And so, you see, it seems like Satan is the prosecuting attorney. Now, this is my take. Prosecuting attorney is Satan, and Jesus is the defense lawyer. Mm -hmm. That's a nice picture. Yeah. So either it's the dragon who stands by the sea on the shore, mm -hmm. or it's the revelator himself, depending on which ancient manuscript we're looking at. But it obviously doesn't matter for the fundamental truth. Well, I like the picture, though, yeah. that the dragon yeah. stood on the seashore, and the dragon is waiting yeah. well, for this happen. beast to yeah. arrive. He plants himself. It's almost as if the dragon, if it is indeed the dragon is Knows. calling up yeah. this beast right from the sea yeah. come forth and the one I he's going to work now. through you know <laughs> it is a really good. horrendous picture that we it have is. you yeah. see yeah. Um, could we read Daniel 7 maybe 7 and 8 is this kind of like what's in those chapters Oh, it's yeah. A whole we, bunch like uh, what's it's, <laughs> it's very much like what's in okay. those Daniel chapters. Daniel being in the Old Testament Yes. Okay, I haven't found it yet. 
You want to uh, start with Daniel 7, right? Sure. Okay. Okay. Who do you would like to read here? Go ahead and just read it quickly. And okay, then... and in Daniel 7, uh, there's a, a vision that Daniel has, mm -hmm. and he wrote it down, and here's what he saw. Okay. He saw in verse 2, the whole sea being stirred up, and four great beasts came up out of the sea. Mm -hmm. Different from one another. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. Okay. okay. Uh, the second one in verse 5 is like a bear. Mm -hmm. The third one in verse 6 is like a leopard. Mm -hmm. And then an awful force, fourth beast. Yeah. It just happens that those three characterizations of the lion and the bear and the leopard in reverse order yeah. is the characterization, uh, characterization of the beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13. In reverse order? Yeah. Oh. But in Daniel 7, it's a number of powers. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 13, it's one power. Mm -hmm. And it's a composite picture of, of what you have in Daniel. It's all put together into one. This one beast kind of has it all. <laughs> has it all. Yeah. yeah, all that's bad. So anyway, there, there, there's that. And verse 7 then of Daniel 7 is, After this I saw a fourth beast, terrifying mm -hmm. and dreadful, mm -hmm. and so on. Okay. And uh, you you got to remember this. You just have to. At the end of verse 8, there were eyes like human eyes in this horn. A horn comes up out of it. And, uh, and a mouth speaking arrogantly, which will be something that plays right into Revelation 13, this arrogant mouth. Hmm. Boastful. Hmm? A boastful mouth. Oh, yeah. My, my Bible says that spoke boastfully. Yeah. That's right. Who is that person? Well, when we see 13.5, 13.5, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead a little now, but here we okay, are. We're back in the book 13, of Revelation. 5, yeah, of Revelation, the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and, and blasphemous words. Yes. Uh -huh. The connection mm -hmm. is pretty explicit, isn't okay, it? Okay, it is. Yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. Did you want to do more from Daniel, well, uh, Carolyn? Well, just, just an overview real quick, and then uh, should we wait on 8? Well, yeah, let's wait on uh, on that. But Daniel 7 has a lot of things in it that refer to what we're going to study in Revelation 13. Yeah, that's right. This Daniel supplies the apocalyptic language okay. that Revelation will use, All without right. a doubt. Okay. Okay, so. Let's go back to 13. Yes, to 13. All right. And uh, well, John, would you read... Uh, the first 10 verses of Revelation 13, please. Yeah, the first 10 verses, that's a good, a good chunk because this chapter really is made up of two halves. Not, that's right. Not three thirds as 12 is. So um, verses 1 to 10 really represents the first uh, chunk of it then. Uh, this is the Revised Standard Version. Your version may vary a little, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the meaning essential truth uh, will remain the same. Uh, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems, or crowns, on its horns, and a blasphemous name on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Now verse 3, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth followed after this beast with wonder. And men worshipped the dragon, verse 4, for he had given his authority to the beast. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Men worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to this beast. Yeah. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who's like this beast, and who can fight against it? Now the next paragraph begins with verse 5. The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. That is to say, this authority that's kind of been delegated to mm -hmm, it from the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the satanic dragon, yeah? And it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Verse 7, also, it was allowed to make war on the saints, and even to conquer them or overcome them. Yeah? And authority was given it over every tribe and people and tongue and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it, every one whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. Now, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. 
If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. But if anyone slays with the sword, with the sword, the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. Boy, that's something. Heavy stuff, isn't it? Heavy stuff. And, and I think the last thing that John read is what it's about. Yeah. Here is a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. Because when you read this, this power yeah. that can even conquer, in some sense, conquer the saints, I mean, you need lots of faith, you need lots of endurance, and this is what the book of Revelation wants us to have. I also have the Good News Bible here. I love this Bible. I do, too. Um, may I read the yeah. uh, verses that John just read? I'll hurry. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown, and on each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. The beast looked like a leopard, with feet like a bear's feet and a mouth like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast also, saying, Who is like the beast who can fight against it? The beast was allowed to make proud claims which were insulting to God, and it was permitted to have authority for 42 months. It began to curse God, his name, the place where he lives, and all those who live in heaven. It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them, and it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language and race, all people living on earth will worship it, except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living God, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. So, a lot in here. Now, who wants to explain what's going on here? <laughs> Is it is I think that the dragon is Satan and the beast is at at that time was a, a Roman power that had Caesars and things that were saying things against God. They were wanted to be worshipped like God, they claimed the authority of God. But it was in the time of early Rome. First they worshipped a goddess named Roma and then they kind of subsided and, and didn't worship her so much until they went to worship the Caesars. Well um, I think what you're saying by this and I think maybe we need to make a Here's a big word, a hermeneutical A what? Point. <laughs> I know you love these words, so I thought I would give you one. Hermeneutics Ooh, has hermeneutics to do with interpretation what? and okay. how we go about interpreting okay. things. Um, the thing about it is that the identification of this beast mm -hmm. and of the second beast and so on mm -hmm. in this chapter, we haven't read about the second beast yet, but the, the interpretations have changed during the course of time. But there is no doubt in my mind, and this is an important point, that no matter what interpretations come later, for John, in John's own time, he could hardly have failed to see this as Roman power. Now, John is in Asia Minor. Yes. All right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the cities that he writes to are located. And that is where emperor worship took place. Yeah. And emperor worship was, was very important to all the provinces. It it's kind of was the glue that kept the provinces together, you see. Uh, everybody united in the worship of him who is the emperor, mm -hmm. and so on. And so, with that the case, if you did not worship the emperor, you're going to run into a number of the problems that this chapter delineates. You're going to get a seal 
uh, I mean, you have a seal from God, but I mean, you're going to be marked out mm -hmm. for death. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, you're going to have trouble with your economic life because you're not going to be able to buy or sell and so on, according to this chapter. So the point is that people living at that time could hardly have failed. I mean, it just, they wouldn't have bounded over that time to later times. They would have looked in their time for a power that represented what John is talking about, and they would have seen something because it was right there. And many of the specifications of this chapter do have a profound application to that time, but I don't want to restrict it to that time, but I want to start with that time. And that's the, that's the principle of interpretation I think is very important. See what it might have meant in John's own day. That see. means this hermeneutic principle involves always starting with what the text meant and then only then moving on to what it means yes. in our time today. Yeah. yeah. Really. Do you want to say some more about that? We have about a minute, John. Well, <clears throat> there have been struggles over how to interpret Revelation, and partly what we're talking about uh, we may need to talk, take up in the next uh, conversation All right. having to do with the perspectives, the eyeglasses that we wear when mm -hmm. we read the text. But I think that principle must undergird what we do. Only thus can we remain secure, otherwise we get in trouble. In yeah. hurry. And we won't limit it to what was happening in the first century. Okay. But we'll start there. But we'll start there. That's the point. All yeah. right. Is there more than one way to interpret this? I there mean, is. There's fellow Christians and who look at it in a different way. Oh, yes. There is. And we're going to keep that a secret until our next conversation. <laughs> so that okay. our, our <laughs> listeners can <laughs> ponder that a little. That's and right. And we'll reveal the secret next time. Yes. <laughs> and now this is uh, Carolyn Thompson, hoping that we have made... Revelation 12 and part of 13 clear. And until next time, we're going to continue, continue with the early Roman power. Until next time, this is Carolyn.